Hey everybody, welcome to this video on soils and agriculture. Uh, we know a bit about soils by this point, and in this video we're going to focus specifically on uh, agricultural soils and some of the details of that. And I'd like to frame this in the context of <clears throat> thinking about organic produce versus regular produce. So obviously organic vegetables are grown without pesticides, without synthetic fertilizers, and usually also uh, not GMO organisms. But this presents some challenges for organic farmers, and it's an open question of whether we could actually feed the world with organic farming practices or not. So even though this may be more desirable, is it realistic? Let's try to understand what we mean or what the, what this, the constraints are on organic agriculture, and then we can try to answer that question a little bit. So in this video, we'll, we'll quickly recap uh, what plants need to survive, kind of a review of photosynthesis. Then we'll look at uh, cation nutrients and soil acidity, so where nutrients are held in the soil. And then we'll finish talking about nitrogen cycling and the need for fertilizer. So what, what do plants do? Plants photosynthesize. And in, in the process of doing that, they make uh, molecules, specifically carbon hydrogen molecules, that we can then eat and get energy from. And to do that, they need four things. They need sunlight, they need carbon dioxide that comes from the atmosphere, they need water that comes from their roots in the soil, and they need nutrients that also come through their roots through the soil. So it's this video here that we're going to talk about how those nutrients are held in soil and made available to plants. And so obviously plants provide us with energy. We can eat plants, but they also end up making hydrocarbons. So almost all of our energy comes from plants. And the way they're, they're making that energy is by using photosynthesis to convert uh, carbon from its oxidized form, CO2, into its reduced form which usually involves a carbon-hydrogen bond, some kind of carbon-hydrogen molecule. Now, animals, in our case, come along and eat these plants. We oxidize that carbon, and uh, we get energy from it. And so animals could include both humans eating plants, but also, of course, bacteria and microorganisms eating plant materials. And they, of course, are responsible for breaking down a lot of plant material in soils. So which part of the soil actually supports agriculture? Uh, it's the A horizon here. Um, the A horizon is composed largely of organic material, and it's where a lot of the nutrients and water are held. So everything we talk about today is going to be happening in this A horizon of the soil. And as I just said, there's a lot of organic material and clay minerals. So a really rich A horizon might contain something like this, a beautiful humic substrate made of organic material and clay particles. Now in that material, hopefully we will find uh, plant nutrients. And nutrients can come really in two flavors. We have cations which are shown here, and they can also come as anions. So we'll see later in the video that some of the really important nutrients are phosphate and nitrate, but all these cations are also really important as well. And we're able to refer to them as ions because in order for a plant to actually use these nutrients, they must be dissolved in ionic form. So plants don't really uptake molecules, they uptake ions. Well, they can uptake molecules, of course, but um, they need to be dissolved ionic species. OK, so let's look at how some of those cation nutrients are held in soil. So these cations are held by what are called colloids. Okay, Colloids includes both clay particles and hummock or organic particles. Okay, Both clays and hummock particles are negatively charged. So colloids are negatively charged. And so therefore, they attract 
cations, all right? So uh, cations can be held in three different places. One, and, and we'll, we'll look, use this figure to illustrate this. Um, so imagine you have a little clay mineral here. It's negatively charged, okay? Some cations are lucky enough to be bonded right next to the clay mineral um, in what's called the stern layer. Uh, and those are held very, very tightly. Another uh, body or supply of cations is held in the diffuse layer, so a, close to the mineral surface but a little bit further away. And then the third area is the soil solution. So by the time you get into the soil solution, these ions are not really attracted to anything. They're just floating in the soil solution. Notice we've got a lot some anions out here as well as cations. So anything in the soil solution is free to get washed away, basically. Whereas anything in the stern layer or the diffuse layer is going to be held. Um, and things in the stern layer are held very tightly. Things in the diffuse layer are held weakly and are often available for exchange with other cations. So just to reiterate, these cations are plant nutrients and a good soil will hold them long enough for plant roots to be able to access them, okay? And so a good soil will have a, a large supply of cations that are what we would call exchangeable. They're held, but also a plant root can come in and get them. And we can quantify that, the amount of exchangeable cations um, with this term called the cation exchange capacity, which as I just said, determines the availability of cations to plants. And the basic idea is that the more colloids you have, so the more of those negatively charged particles, the, the more cations you can store and the higher your cation exchange capacity is. So organic material, hummus, has an amazing cation exchange capacity. It has a lot of cations held in that diffuse layer. Clay minerals are also really, really good, um, but not quite as good as organics. But basically, we want clays and we want organics that's gonna let us hold a lot of cations in our soil. Now, cation exchange capacity is always defined in terms of a given acidity of the soil. And that's because um, strong acids have a lot of hydrogen, okay? We can see the pH scale. Uh, the low pH numbers here um, are acids. They have a lot of hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is also a cation, okay? So unfortunately, when you have an acid soil, those H plus cations are going to actually come in and compete with your other cations. And so let's just look at how this works. Here's our colloids. All the cations are jockeying to get close to the, the colloids. If we suddenly flood this with a ton of H plus, so in other words, we have an acid soil with a lot of hydrogen, those little hydrogens are gonna come in and they're gonna compete with all the other cations and they are gonna displace those other cations. And those other cations are gonna get bumped out into the soil solution and potentially washed away. Now that's bad because we don't want hydrogen. We don't need it. It's not a nutrient. And if, it, if we have too much of it in an acid soil, it's gonna cause us to lose nutrients like sodium, potassium, or nitrate. And that's bad. So, so acid soils are bad. Now, one other thing about this, uh, stronger cations, like say aluminum three plus, tend to be able to bond more strongly to the colloids, and they're not about to get displaced by the H plus. So what tends to happen in an acid soil, we tend to lose all of our weaker cations and we tend to enrich the aluminum, which is able to bond with these things. And so eventually, you get an aluminum-rich soil, and you can even have aluminum floating around in the soil solution. 
So what's the effect of enriching aluminum in a soil? Turns out aluminum is actually poisonous to plants. And that's illustrated here with um, some examples of soybean leaves that were grown under different pH soils. And uh, the soybeans grown in the higher pH soils with more available aluminum actually are poisoned in are actually getting sick. So high pH soils can actually be toxic uh, to plants in addition to just having less nutrients. So how can we combat soil acidity? Uh, soil acidity is a natural phenomena. Uh, we've learned in previous videos that rainwater is actually naturally acidic due to carbonic acid. And one way to combat this acidity is to use what's called liming. To basically place a base material, in this case calcium carbonate is a base, that reacts readily with acids. So this limestone, that's literally what it is, this guy's spreading crushed limestone on his field, actually reacts with the hydrogen, creates a calcium ion, carbon dioxide, and water. So we basically consume, suck up some of those H plus ions, and uh, raise the pH of the soil, make it less acidic, and make it a happier place for, for plants. So adding carbonate or lime to soil is usually a good way to fight acidity. OK, so we've looked at how cation nutrients are held in soils. Let's finish up by looking at another nutrient now, and that is nitrogen. And nitrogen is an absolutely critical plant nutrient. It's probably the most critical. And it's an interesting one because although most nutrients come from rocks, the weathering of rocks, nitrogen comes from the atmosphere where it's held as N2 gas. And so how do plants get this? Well, this N2 gas has to first be uh, fixed by nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So bacteria in soil have to first um, convert that, that nitrogen gas into either uh, nit nitrite or nitrate. And this is a super slow process. So basically, it's hard to get nitrogen out of the air and into soil. So most nitrogen in soil actually comes from the breakdown of dead plants and organisms. It comes from things that already had nitrogen in them and died and are getting recycled. So we often think of the nitrogen in soils as really being uh, recycled from dead plants and animals as opposed to coming out of the atmosphere. Um, and so. The problem is agriculture can break that recycling of nitrogen. And let's look at how that happens. So here's the deal. Um, most plant material is what's called cellulose. That would be woody and leafy parts of the plants. Okay. So in the case of corn, that would be a corn stalk or a corn leaf. Basically the parts we don't eat. Now cellulose doesn't have any nitrogen. It's only made of carbons and hydrogens. So that's fine. We don't need nitrogen to make cellulose. But most of the nitrogen goes into the good parts of the plant, the proteins, the fats, the waxes. So a lot of nitrogen ends up being in the seeds and fruits of plants. So in the case of corn, all the nitrogen is going to be right in these corn kernels, which is, of course, what we eat. Now, here's the problem. When you grow a crop like corn, the seeds and fruits don't go back into the soil. Animals, like us, eat those seeds and fruits. And so what we're basically doing is removing the nitrogen from the soil cycle. Now, this could be humans eating it. This could be animals eating it. Um, but quite often, all that's left behind after a field has been harvested is a bunch of cellulose, no nitrogen. Where did all that nitrogen go? Well, it went into an animal's digestive system, came out the other side as manure. Okay, So a lot of the nitrogen ends up in the manure. So now this is where fertilizer comes in. The soil cannot replenish that nitrogen because it can't make it from air fast enough. It needs to recycle it is the way to get it. Now, 
in industrial agriculture, of course, we're not necessarily putting that nitrogen back in. And nowadays, we'll often put that nitrogen back in using fertilizer. So what are fertilizer? What is fertilizer? Well, it's some kind of molecule, for example, ammonium nitrate or ammonium phosphate, which can supply nitrogen in both of its readily available formats. So that's a huge advantage. You put this stuff in the soil, it's water soluble. These ions go right into solution and they're immediately available for plants. Um, and you can, moreover, you can add exactly as much as you need and you can add phosphates or sulfates depending on exactly what your plants need. And that's a big advantage. But there's also many issues with fertilizer. One big issue is there's no texture going back into the soil. You're not adding colloids back in. So there's not a lot of ways for the soil to retain these nutrients, these ions, and they tend to run right off as soon as the first rainstorm hits because there's nothing to bind with in the soil. Um, so there's a big runoff issue that we'll look at in future videos. Also, fertilizer is incredibly energy intensive to produce. It's made in a factory using an electrical process that takes a lot of electricity. So there's a lot of collateral environmental effects. And another big disadvantage of using fertilizer is that uh, no other micronutrients are produced. So by that, I mean you're giving nitrate and phosphate, but you're not replenishing the soil in those other cations, potassium, sodium. So you might grow a great vegetable, but it might not have as many cations in it as a vegetable that's grown in a natural soil. Now, in contrast, uh, organic farming practices uh, typically fertilize their crops and fields with actual manure or compost, some derivative that might include manure, food waste. Um, basically, they try to return the nitrogen back to the soil by actually taking animal waste and food waste that has nitrogen in it and, and bringing that back into the soil. So this has a couple of potential advantages. One is it does have texture. There's a lot of colloidal material, so you're adding the ability for that soil to hold water and hold nutrients much better. Um, now, the nitrogen and phosphorus is present but it's often bound up in more complex molecules that haven't quite been broken down yet. Now, that's actually, although it's not immediately available to the plant, in some ways that's an advantage because it, that nitrogen and phosphorus doesn't run off as quickly and it can be slowly converted to a usable form by organisms over time. So it's a little bit better kind of time release source of nitrogen and phosphorus than just directly putting synthetic fertilizer on your field. Um, but of course, there's trade-offs. And to come back to our original question, could organic farming feed the world effectively? Um, it's a tough question because the large industrial agricultural fields that supply much of our food, it would be very difficult to fertilize them with um, compost and manure waste. We simply don't have enough volume uh, to do that. Although perhaps with creative solutions, um, we could move in that direction in the future. So in summary, uh, we looked at what plants need to survive and how they provide us with food. We looked at how cation nutrients are held in soil and the effects of soil acidity on, f on flushing out some of those cations. And then we looked at nitrogen cycling and the need for fertilizer. Here's a couple concept questions, and you can take the quiz uh, or find the quiz link below this YouTube video. Thanks.